Welcome to Problematic and Taboo Topics. Um, today, we are going to be dealing with all of the nuances of introducing these harder topics in the game that I am personally excited to talk about. Um, and I would hope other people would like to see an industry where we're able to talk about hard topics in a respectful and really meaningful way. My name is Anne Ratchet, uh, pronoun Zizer. I am a cultural consultant specifically in the realms of mental health and medicine. And this is my co-panelist. I'm Jason Morningstar. I'm creative director at Bully Pulpit Games. My pronouns are he, him. And one thing I just quickly wanted to address, it might seem a little bit weird having two white people talk about this type of thing by ourselves. This was not the intention. There was last minute scheduling, but we did work with James Mendez Hodes in order to organize and schedule this panel. So it wasn't without concerns. Um, and we will be going into the details of how you can work with all of us and hopefully make good games. So let's start off with what is what makes a topic taboo in current game design? A great question. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know. Um... That's that's such an awkward framing, right? To say that something is when I think of taboo in sort of Western parlance, it means like off limits, like it's something that we just cannot touch. And I, I'm not convinced that 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 really exists. I think there's a um, that there is a, an equation that you have to sort of do mentally about uh, the the various pieces involved in making the choice to create something that's going to make people uncomfortable or that m some people might find difficult or inappropriate. And there's lots of questions I'm sure we're going to get into about whether it's the right thing for you to be doing. Like, is it your own voice that's speaking on the topic? Um, but in general, like, I, I'm trying to think of things that there shouldn't be games about or that um, our culture says there should never be a game about this. And I'm kind of coming up blank from my point of view. And I have a very expansive and ecumenical point of view on this. And I'm sure there are people who are like, I have hard limits about what I think is appropriate, uh, but I, I don't necessarily agree with that. What about you? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely like games that are not for everyone. And I'm strongly mm -hmm. in the cat camp that not every game is for everyone. But one of the things that I've seen a lot is these topics that are deemed taboo are typically a lot of people's actual experiences that are really hard to talk about. And when they're done wrong, they're done really wrong. And they create a lot of damage for the community that they're trying to represent or sometimes ignore. So we end up sometimes with games that when trying to be respectful and avoid these taboo topics, you end up with erasure instead, which is a different form of violence. And I don't feel like that's the answer. Like, I have mental health disorders. I am chronically ill. I want to be able to talk about those and be able to share those with other people and give them a little bit of insight into my life. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's like, oh, we can't do that is pretty painful. You, I think you, it's you, also important to uh, highlight that when we talk about these things, uh, there's two different ways we deal with games. Some are some are escape as fantasy and other is identity narrative. And I think where these taboo topics do really well is identity narrative. It's not to say you can't do escapist fantasy dealing with like race or uh, like I like writing sanity mechanics, but if it's purely escapist fantasy, you have to deal with the topics differently than if it's based on a person's actual experiences. Um, so one of the questions that comes up a lot is when do you know a tab like you are writing a game about a taboo topic? Because I found that it's not always obvious. And it's sometimes when you're doing the first play test, you sit down and it's like, oh, this is going in a direction that I did not intend, or maybe I did, but players took it in a different direction than I was trying to communicate it. So is it my fault? Is it the player's fault? Like what happened? Uh, I, I do have some thoughts about that. Uh, first of all, I think once you've released a, a game into the world, you have no control over how people interpret it or how people engage with it. Uh, and if they do it in ways that are harmful and insensitive, that, that cannot be on you. Uh, 
That said, as, as a game designer, it's your responsibility to give them all the tools they need to do it right and to clearly communicate in every way that you can the appropriate way to engage with the material. And that's so much more important if the topic itself is going to be problematic or potentially harmful as opposed to your the escapist model which which can also be problematic and harmful as we know so it's it's a it's a pretty complicated knot uh, when you talked about the difference between sort of personal narrative and um, escapism uh, the the way that i often frame that is uh, type one and type two fun type one fun being like we're gonna enjoy this and laugh and it's just gonna be something that we do together that makes us all feel feel good and maybe doesn't have a ton of weight to it and type two fun being something that maybe in the moment is difficult or challenging uh maybe it's it, it's not something that we're laughing about as as we go through the experience but after the fact we're glad that we did it or we learned something or we experienced empathy or catharsis and then of course there's type three fun which is it wasn't fun at all and we thought it would be um so like a different way to, to frame that as well can you define what type three fun is Type three fun is uh, we went into this experience uh, fully expecting to have a good time either by either definition. We were going to have type one fun. We were going to have type two fun. And that didn't happen. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the, the game failed us. Uh, our fellow players failed us. We failed ourselves. Something didn't work. Uh, somebody got hurt. Uh, we had a bad time. No fun was had. That's That's what I mean by that. And I think we probably it's probably safe to assume we've all had that experience in one way or another. So uh, one of the things that I find when I've had these discussions previously um, is people will talk about a game that they went to a convention, somebody pulled out a play test, and at the end of the session, they were like, wow, that was great. You cannot make this game. Players that's are not ready for yep. it. Yes, yeah. that's happened to me. Uh, uh, I have a really beautiful example of that. Uh, if you if you'd like me to share, please do a, a failing. Uh, so I wrote a game that I was really excited about, uh, and I play tested it at Metatopia, and uh, we we played, and I I sensed that something was a little off kilter, uh, and after the game, several of the players independently pulled me aside and said, "No, you're you're not thinking this through. You're making some mistakes here that will be really harmful. This this game has the." opportunity uh, it's encouraging uh active harm uh and uh it was great to hear i was so grateful to get that feedback because it was uh it was just myopia i was so uh, i was so excited about the concept that i didn't think about the implications of the concept so in essence what i did is write a um a colonialism simulator from the point of view of the colonizers and it just it, it was not a good idea and uh, I was so glad that people were like, hey, hit the brakes. What you're doing here is not, not it's not good work and it's going to hurt a lot of people. Uh, so I think we can mostly understand that like writing a colonialist game from the perspective of a colonialist is probably not a game that anybody needs to play ever. Because right. we, we know that narrative. We've we, played we that narrative. We're ready for the next thing. Yep. Um, but... Some, like, I don't think that's every case. It's not an obvious of, like, this simply should not be a game. Right. What if no. it is dealing with, like, a good topic that when we say players aren't ready is that they're not far enough along. So, again, what if it's dealing with specifically a game about mental diseases? Okay. Like, should that game not exist? No, um, I mean, I can think of games that are about... Um mental illness that, that do exist. I think it's a, it's a valid topic. And I think that the people who uh, should be making those games are people who, who are ex living in that world. You know, I, I want to hear people's own voices about these topics. I think that um, uh, it would, it would be inappropriate for me uh, unless, you know, like I, I was working in partnership with somebody who was experiencing a particular mental illness that I wanted to talk about or that I had a consultant who could guide me to, to just say, I want to make a game about that. I think that's maybe maybe a decade ago, that was fine, uh, just because of sort of where things were, but that's certainly not appropriate anymore. And I would really sort of cast a, a pretty suspicious eye at, at a game that came out of a process that didn't include the voices of people for whom it was lived experience at this point. Um, I think it's also really important to consider the private game designer versus the public game designer. Mm -hmm. 
because like there are games for private consumption and then there's games for mass market. And I don't want to say that like we should control every person's game design, including what they design specifically for their friends that they're going to see no money for. And therefore, like, it would be nice to hire a consultant, but practically speaking, not everybody has funds for that. And so should they not write a Call of Cthulhu adventure for their friends? Yeah, I think, and that's a really good point. And there's a there's a really broad spectrum of intention around design. Uh, and if your intention is to make something that you're going to enjoy but never share or, or just share with a close group of trusted friends, you can definitely take more risks and push more boundaries because you're already in a community of trust. Uh, I think that as that circle expands, if you're going to, and I don't think it's about money. I think it's more about uh, how you're sharing your work. Uh, because if you put it out there for free, it's still, uh, you're still sharing with the world, the same mechanisms of harm can potentially exist for it. Oh, as opposed to charging 25 bucks, it's still, it, it's still out there in the, in the ecosystem. So, uh, yeah, I think your intentions and what you're doing with the, the, the game are very important. And I, and I wouldn't want uh, anybody to be like, well, I guess I can't make a game about this thing that I'm interested in and that I care about because it's, it's not my lived experience. Like it, it's such an awkward uh, place to be. I think that it, it requires sensitivity and, uh, and thoughtfulness and community, frankly, uh, if, if you're in that situation. So like, I think we could talk a little bit about your personal experience. One of the things you're known for is being a niche history buff True. and becoming extremely well-versed in maybe 10 years of Russian history. And like, yeah. how can people use skills like that in order to make a hard topic a little bit more accessible even for a lay person? Well, okay, so if you want to talk about uh, my game Night Witches, which uh, is about women during the Second World War in the Soviet Union, uh, obviously there are a couple, of, uh, a couple of affinity groups there to which I do not belong. Uh, and I had to uh, find people who were much closer to that lived experience to help me with it, to make sure that I wasn't stepping on my own toes or uh, creating something that was potentially harmful. Um, and I did. Uh, I talked to other Russian historians. I talked to native Russians um, and I talked to women uh, to, to try to make sure that uh, what I was presenting uh, was both uh, appropriate and that was honoring ground truth. In, in that case, uh, I was keenly aware and remain keenly aware that this is living history, that I could meet some of these women that this game is about. And I needed, I, I, I needed in the process of design at every step, it was sort of a reality check for me to say, if I met one of these women, could I talk about this and be proud of what I've done? Uh, and if the answer was no, then I wasn't going to do it. So. Uh, so when we're talking about like the players aren't ready, one of the things I really like to consider about is like, sometimes it is a lived experience that people don't know how to navigate effectively. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we get them ready? Or how do we approach this conversation? Because at the end of the day, you are creating either a macro or a micro, micro uh, conversation at the table. And we all need to participate and talk about it. And so I think part of it is also like getting consent. Like some people can consent into a game that they are prepared to at least explore with, even if they're cap like they know they're capable of messing up somewhere. But is there anything else we can do to like further the conversation and maybe that's, take it in yeah. steps? Yeah, that's, that's something that Mendez had mentioned when we sort of talked about uh, this panel uh, was the idea that, um, any of these topics really require sort of explicit consent from the participants if you're going to approach it in a gaming way because our implicit consent to playing role-playing games just doesn't really include them. So you can't assume uh, that if someone comes to play Night Witches that they're ready to talk about endemic sexism, right? And they're not ready to talk about totalitarianism or genocide. Um, which are all things that will happen and, and you know, will be part of the universe of, of play. Uh, so you kind of need to 
lay that out. And I think as a designer, you can foreground those things as sort of, you know, uh, content warnings, right? At the beginning of the of the game, you can say, these are things that will be part of this experience. Uh, if these are things that you don't want, let's play something different. Um, if these are things that you don't want, don't offer this game to your friends. And if you do, make sure you tell them what they're in for. Yeah, that reminds me of like uh, Sharon's introduction to Bluebeard's Bride is one of my favorite. Yeah, he describes it on. as feminist feminine horror. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not here to explore your feminine side and deal with like this really intense take of the live experience of just a woman, find something else to play. Yeah, like, it's, the wrong, it's the wrong game for you. That's okay. Yeah. Now, um, can and I ask you a question? And go for it. So you had uh, said just a moment ago, uh, players being not ready. Can we can we unpack that a little bit? Uh, I'm, yeah. I want to know um, what you mean. So it's a, it's mostly a phrase that I hear a lot. What they typically mean is when you sit down with your friends, you know what they're versed with. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what you've studied, you know what you talk about, you know what the common protocols are. Um, and... The problem is when we talk about players at broad, we're typically thinking of a cis heterosexual white man. Like that's sure. just what the baseline of a player is in most people's headcanon. And it's not statistically average, like uh, not statistically significant. We've done the research and the average gamer is actually a white woman in her late twenties, early thirties. The last time they did the statistics of it um, but that's not what the mass market considers. So we have to think about what does a white man like think about these type of topics? Are they capable of doing things? And it's more about preparing for impact of damage rather than saying like, no, you can't play this game because like it, that is the most privileged population. That's who I want playing my game. But the question is, like, am I giving you the skill sets to do it appropriately? Mm -hmm. um, what baseline do you come in with that I don't have to teach? Or what do I have to start the education with? So I'll use an example of what I do in my work with sanity mechanics. Um, one of the things I personally specialize in is anxiety mechanics or anxiety disorders in general. And how I talk about it is my favorite sanity mechanics that are either mass market or are coming down the pipeline are about a stressed and tired brain. Or in other words, bad mental health. We all have bad mental health days. That is not special to any disorder. Like we all experience bad mental health. So let's talk about that because most people don't even have that communication level. So if we explore that, we can explore a whole bunch of like intense psychological topics without going into something that is the next step because we have to talk about bad mental health and be able of talking about that before we move on to let's talk about psychological disorders or there's something else going on. And more importantly, it's a lived experience that alters every aspect of a person's life. So the entire social construct of how a person lived their life is also now altered. And it is the next step of the conversation. I wanna get there, I wanna teach about that. But the practical reality is when I have to sit most of my clients down and say, let's talk bad mental health versus mental illness, it tells me we're not ready to talk about mental illness. I gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and uh, as a designer, one thing that I, I think is totally valid and that is pretty rare, but, but could be more common is to situate your game very explicitly. Uh, for example, to say this is not a game for you to play if you don't have this set of skills or this set of experience or whatever. Um, I think people don't do that because the 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 general feeling, and I, I think it's usually right, is that you want as many people as possible to play your game. But if uh, if you can, and you obviously can't stop anybody from engaging with it, but you can say, hey man, if if you don't, if you really don't understand this topic, you're not going to have a good time playing. Uh, I think that's something that we could do more of, and I think it's a very legitimate approach. People don't do it too much, but occasionally you'll see that. 
the other, other thing uh, that relates relates to that is that um, uh, you can often sort of segment the instructional design attached to your game and say, if you're brand new to this, please start here. If you have these familiarities uh, or you've played before, start here. If you if you're an expert at this, just start here. You know, just start playing because you know what's up. Um, okay. and, and and that uh, communicates to the, the participant that they have some control over their experience. And it also get, allows you as the designer to sort of ease them into whatever the material is. I also think it's like a really uh, useful thing to think about genre when we're dealing with how to get people ready. Um, I really like talking about the difference between horror and comedy mm -hmm. and how I usually dif differentiate the two of them is we say like the introduction to a lot of things is we make fun of it. We put it into comedy, stand up one thing or another. And I'm like, that's great, but it means we're talking about the topic. What if we're not even ready to talk about it? And that's what I like horror is horror is a genre of metaphor. So I think Babadook is one of the best examples of an introduction into uh, adolescent mental health because it's an entire allegory about it. Um, and it inspires conversation, but the people who aren't ready can still dip their toes in the water and decide, oh, I'm not ready for this. And they yeah. can come back later. Yeah, I think that that's really smart. Uh, and you can do that in game design as well, right? If, if you if you put in abstraction that allows someone to have the experience in a variety of ways uh, from, like, for example, uh, if we made a game about Animal Farm, about the, the book, um, somebody could play it as a game about cool animals doing animal stuff. And someone else could be like, oh, well, obviously this is a politi political commentary. Uh, and both those people could enjoy it. And at the end of it, maybe they could have a conversation where the cool animal person would get to see a little bit more than they had, and you know, initially uh, perceived. Um, I, I feel like I do that in some of my games. I have games that are fun to play, type one or type two. Uh, but afterward, they give you an offer and say, if if you want to know more about this, I hope I've piqued your interest or um, what you've just experienced is similar to this. And you can, you know, you could pursue this more uh, or maybe you have some. Yeah. Now. I'm distinctly remembering playing Winterhorn with you. Yeah. And that's a good our example. team won. Yeah. Fantastically. Yay. We were like, yeah. Oh, there actually weren't any bombs to begin with. That was never officially said. <laughs> what yeah. did we do? You, you were very bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, we were exceptional. I, I, you, you were, you were, yes, I remember that well. You, uh, the, the, the thing ab about that is that that's social engineering too, right? Which is another tool that game designers have. I wanted you to have that experience. The game is built to be competitive. It's sort of you against the situation. And it's, it's easy to shut off your ethical and moral compass at that point. Because... You've been instructed to do to accomplish a task, and accomplishing that task has a reward. You accomplish that task and you celebrate, and then you realize that the task itself is suspect or openly corrupt. Uh, and that was like by design. Uh, I was really leveraging the fact that, particularly gamers, but really it works with anybody. Once you say these are the rules, this is your objective. Now go get it. They'll do their best to do that. Uh, it's very rare in that game for someone to be like, hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, yeah. That's I think cool. this is actually like a fantastic leeway to our next point where safety tools, calibration. Do we actually want them? And or specifically, do we, we want them for sure? But like, how do we want to build them into the game? Or do we want them built into the game? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And uh, well, first of all, um, the uh, I, I would challenge your assumption that we always want safety tools, but that's maybe a different conversation. Uh, I always oh, want safety tools. The TLDR right. of the why we wouldn't want them? Oh, oh just, just I, I don't want to exclude designs that are commentary on safety in general uh, with informed consent. Uh, I, I've seen it done poorly, but I think it could be done well by somebody who really cared about the topic. Just, I, I don't want to shut it down reflexively. But yes, all my games are going to have some way to address safety in them. I think that that's very appropriate. Even if it's 
uh, depending on the game, it might be, a, you know, a paragraph that says, choose some tools that are comfortable in your culture of play and use them religiously when you play this. Uh, it may not be something that's customized for every particular game. Uh, or maybe it is. It, it really, I think that uh, there's a lot of gray area there and you need to be thoughtful about the thing that you're making and the potential the dangers and impacts and then choose accordingly. That's how I feel. How about how do you feel about it? Uh, so I am mixed. Um, I really take away Sadia Bias's interpretation when it comes to safety. And what they say is that a good safety mechanic is a failure of a safe community. Um, which is my paraphrasing of it, but they strongly believe that like, if you have to have a safety mechanic. I think we have a visitor. I didn't mean to visit, I'm leaving. I pushed the wrong button. Tim Hutchings, Sorry. ladies and gentlemen. That's me, leaving. Okay, <laughs> um, technical difficulties back on track. Um, but yeah, um, so I'm strongly influenced by what can we do at a table in order to build up something so that we don't need to use a safety mechanic because like really good games push us to our limits without pushing us beyond what we're capable of dealing with or like not everyone can read body language, but I, <laughs> um, but, uh, as someone who can read body language and uses it quite fundamentally in a lot of the things that I do, I want to kind of look at the table, see where they're going and direct what kind of play I'm doing or how I want to alter my design in order to sometimes get discomfort out of them. Because that's one of the things that can be really powerful about these kind of games is it's permission to be uncomfortable and allow us to like actually reflect on how the world isn't always good and how we can be better. Um, and so while I never play without a safety tool, like at the very least we have a verbal X card on the table. Mm -hmm. I even use that in my like colloquial conversations where it's just like X card moving on. Um, but, uh, I would like to see us not simply rely on the X card. I'd like to see something else built into the game in order to direct us to a more meaningful conversation about safety rather than just, we have the X card, so no harm can be done. Right. And that, which is, uh, you know, that's clearly a, a logical fallacy. Um, and you see, it, you do see that happen uh, and it's, wrong, right? The people are making a mistake if they think that that having a tool resolves the need to trust each other, to uh, communicate, to play in a way that's thoughtful and considered. Um, for sure. I agree with that. I don't agree. Uh, and this is this is where panels get good, right? Um, I, I don't agree with the idea that um, invoking a safety mechanic means that your community has failed. I, I think that that is... Uh, uh, not true. So let's transition a little bit. Um, okay. So we've established that these are going to be conversations. Uh, so with the delicate nature of these hard conversations, what are the major concerns of trained reflexes that we've developed from other games that we might be bringing into these games? For example, in a lot of games, the punch our conflicts away. Yeah, that's yep. uh, this that's, is a rational way that people deal with conflict in real life. Is I punch the shopkeeper because they overcharge me. Yeah, well, um, please don't try that in real life. It's not an effective way of relating to people. But you know what? In a power fantasy, maybe it is right. So there's there's again a lot of nuance here because I think that there there's a pretty big cohort that genuinely enjoys exactly that situation. Um, where they're in charge and they can get what they want and they're tough and capable and powerful and it is a fantasy and they know it and they're with people who also know it and they're having a good time. I don't necessarily think that that's a problem um, as long as everybody's in playing the same game, right? And that they're all consenting to that experience. That's great. It's not for me. I, I don't find that fun. I don't think it's for you. And most of the time, you probably most don't of the find time, that fun. no. 
Uh, but like, don't get me wrong, I like a good con buffer, but that is a completely different situation. Absolutely right. Uh, but but so I don't want to um, I don't want to set up like a, a a hierarchy of 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 goodness around this topic because I don't think that that's legitimate. Um, but I think it's fair to say that like we're not here to judge games. We're yeah. here to talk about like how we can design a little bit more considerately. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, and I, I think that um, one thing that I see uh, in game design a lot is that uh, people who think of games based on the games that they've played tend to make games that emulate the things that they know. And if what you know is punching people in the face, then your game's going to have punching people in the face in it, whether it needs it or not. Uh, and uh, in those cases, I just encourage people to, you know, play more games, try different things, um, see what's out there that challenges your assumptions. Because, uh, you know, you want your game to reflect the things that you care about and the things that you care about aren't relevant and they're not related to other games necessarily. I mean, it may be that you're writing in conversation or you're writing as a counterpoint to another piece of work, but more, more likely you just, you're really interested in brain surgery and you want to make a game about brain surgery. Well, that game doesn't need a combat mechanic, you know, even though that every game you've ever seen has one. Uh, so one of the skills I've picked up personally from being a GM at being at a lot of tables is a thing I call a button. Uh, which is specifically advice that I give where I'm like, would your character do this when I have a player at the table who's being indecisive or for some other reason is stalling play a little bit? I don't want to pressure them, but I want them to know that there are options that maybe in the moment they're not thinking of that are in line with their character and like makes them feel empowered without having to like direct the scene completely somewhere else, which if you're in a combat, like you can't do, it's your turn. We have to know what you're doing before we decide the next thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's a way we can build these mechanics into a game in order to redirect in syncs. And yeah, then from there, how do we make people trust the mechanics that we've built? Oh, see, that's a, that's a really big, interesting question. So the, the, I think that's a very common situation in, in, a, in many games where there's someone who just takes a little time, they need a little bit more time to think through the options, or someone who is new and, and kind of uncomfortable with the, the mode of interaction. Uh, and the perception there is often, well, they're slowing things down. Let's, let's speed this up. There's other people waiting. That happens, particularly at convention games, it happens quite a lot. I think that um, in uh, home games, uh, there are there's fewer pressures. The decisions that you make uh, are in a community of love and trust, and you don't have to worry about it. And so often it comes easier. Um, I th but um, yeah, so so the approach that you suggest with with um, providing them with options makes a lot of sense to me. Usually, the the first thing that I do if I see that happening is say, do you do you want some suggestions? Do you you know where where are you at right now? Um, is this a situation where uh, the player needs to just take their time and we just need to be patient? Do they want some help? Uh, can we come back to them? Let's let, like, find out what the what the situation with them is. And once you sort of know that, then you know it for the rest of your time together. Um, but it may be very different. It may be that they just need to think about it. And what they need is for you to talk to somebody else for a minute. Or maybe they need just to, to ruminate on that and everybody just needs to be patient. Whatever it is, uh, knowing what it is, I think is very helpful. Yeah, I'm also thinking about like one of the games that I'm working on at the moment, which unfortunately doesn't have a Kickstarter page or anything like that. It'll come down in a couple of months. Um, but it's, it's working on a sanity mechanic where in a lot of Cthulian games or Lovecraftian games, um, People are like, I'm going mad. And the game is about going mad. Like, we're not avoiding that. Mm -hmm. But I've seen that there are some players who, usually due to lack of education about what the system is actually doing, will start to go off in their own direction. And, like, 
I don't blame them because like there's still stuff that we need to hammer out. This is a normal reaction. But it's when you're looking at it from a design perspective, these are people doing exactly the opposite of what you want them to be doing. And as I mentioned, like it's usually due to lack of education. Like the mechanic works when people use it. When you and say when education, trust it. do you mean uh, like uh, system mastery, understanding the game and how the game works? Or do you mean education? Yeah, sort of a like not even like deeply intense, knowing the system mastery, just like knowing what the role of the mechanic is. For example, oh, okay. I don't have to act mad because if I listen to the card, I simply will be. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, and so someone who's doing that, they just need to, they kind of need to be taken aside and explained what's going on in that case. I don't say? even think you need to take them aside. Um, what I've been noticing from our uh, play tests is it usually is like in the very beginning when you're introducing the mechanics is that we need to polish how you introduce the mechanics because Makes sense. there's just somewhere where it's just not clicking. There's no fault of the player. We just have a failure to communicate. Which is, that's so interesting to me because the thing you said just a moment ago was um, how can we make people trust mechanics, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so that's not a situation where they're not, it, it, they're not trusting what it says. They're just not, it's not clicking with them. They're not understanding it. It's not being communicated to them effectively, right? Yeah. And I, at least for me, I, I do think of that as a trust issue because it's trust within oneself versus oh, okay. trust within the system that is established. Okay. People are typically going to trust themselves over something new. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's how do you redirect that focus of um, my own personal skills as a player to the game is facilitating me being a good player. And I, I think that's one of the things that makes me like the games that I do is the game will make me a good player if I simply use what the game has. Yeah, that's. I think there's real wisdom in that, um, and I, I feel the same way. Like I want to make a game that just it works, it's functional. That if you play it the way I've asked you to play it, you're gonna at least have an okay experience and maybe a really good one. Um, and uh, it, it, yes, I, I think that's so important as a designer. That should be your goal, right? Like you're part of this experience. Make it make it good for people. Don't rely on them to bring their own skill or knowledge or talent to make it good. Because if they have skill, knowledge, and talent, they can make anything good. They don't need your game. Um, that's kind of the way I feel about that. Yeah. So I think we're going to get into our last big topic um, yeah. is cultural consultants. Uh, let's first off by starting, uh, what is the difference between a cultural consultant and a sensitivity reader? That's, From okay. So uh, Mendez talked about this to us a little bit didn't yeah. he? Um, and uh, suggested that the difference is, is sort of where in the process and how active you are. So like a sensitivity reader is kind of becoming later in the process and be giving advice on what you've done, whereas a cultural yeah. consultant maybe is coming early in the process and giving you advice on maybe what you should be doing. Uh, and you can see the difference in values there, but not necessarily difference in the work that they're doing. Does that seem fair to you? I think it's also a little bit of like, not to disregard everything to the pocketbook, but it is a thing that people really consider if they're getting a sensitivity reader. Um, and one of the big things is you think like, if you did a good job, if you didn't have problems, you would think a sensitivity reader is cheaper because they're coming in at the end and just like rubber stamping, yep, you're good. You didn't do anything bad. <laughs> Congratulations, you've been sensitive. Yes. Um, which like is true if you did a good job, sure. But if you did a good job, then also you may or may not actually need a sensitivity reader. And you probably have some experience on the topic that just over, over escapes everything else. Um, one of the big things that I know Mendez talks about is if you use a cultural consultant who's there from the get-go, I have an idea. Here's what I think are the issues. 
here are the actual issues, here's how you can address them, here's how you can retarget everything that you're doing. And in the long run, a cultural consultant will run you cheaper because with the sensitivity reader, not only is it going to be labor intensive because you've written everything, you're done, now you have to rewrite everything again because you misunderstood what asexuality was and you ended up writing a completely offensive character. Mm -hmm. And so you have to reconstruct your entire work and then go back and rehire the person to make sure that your next attempt is better, even though like your storyline might be now a complete mess and all sorts of other issues arise. Um, yeah, that that makes a lot of point. sense. It's, it's from the point of view of a, like a publisher, uh, uh, it would seem th like what you said is absolutely true. I can tell you from experience but it would seem that the reverse would be true. It, it, it seems like it would be much less expensive and easier to get somebody at the end than at the beginning, but it's, you're right, it's not true. Yeah, so when do you need a cultural consultant? And more importantly, why do you actually want to use one? Well, uh, so I, I think the, the best way to know that you need somebody is to look at your work and ask if it really reflects your lived experience and and not just what you know because like it's easy to know a lot of stuff it's easy to to do research uh, that's something that anybody can do and become sort of a an expert on a topic even on a culture maybe but that's very different from living it uh, and it's very different from uh, being sensitive to how it's being communicated and so once you've, once you've, that's a really obvious break point, right? So uh, I really need to talk to somebody if I'm making a game about the Maori, right? I, I need to, I need to either have a Maori cultural consultant or I need to have a, 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 even better, a Maori collaborator on that project who can at the very beginning be like, yeah, this is not cool. You shouldn't do it. Or yes, let's do it together. Or actually I should do this. Uh, any of which is an appropriate response to that kind of a pitch. Um, so, so like that's the most obvious case. I think um, the, the more subtle case that would that would call out for a cultural consultant would be feedback from from playtest of blind spots that that you had uh, that um, you weren't even aware of. Uh, so, you're aware of it; it's obvious, or you're not aware of it, and somebody needs to tell you. I think uh, you may not be able to see it yourself sometimes. Yeah. Um, and for me, like, I really want to highlight that, like, when you work with a cultural consultant, like, we work as hard as possible to make it enjoyable, make it mm -hmm. educational, because we want to be excited about your game. We want to make it a good game. And in my experience, one of the big things that comes is when you do a more accurate representation, the game is better for it. Yeah, like, absolutely. It's just there's no question that uh, the values, the value added to the product by engaging with these services is very high. Totally. Yeah. Um, and so the last scheduled question we have, um, which is one that I've come across quite a few times, is people are really concerned about maintaining it creative integrity when working with a cultural consultant. So okay. as someone who's done it, like how how do you do that? Well, uh, I mean, it's your product, right? You're gonna, you're gonna, you have to decide whether you're going to listen to the expert that you've paid, or whether you're not. Um, and that's your call always, right? Um, I, I, I can't tell you what the circumstance is where you should stop listening to the expert that you've paid, but maybe, maybe that's there. You know, maybe there's a point at which you're like, well. I hear what you're saying, and I know that I know it to be true. I know that my other option is offensive, but I'm going to do it anyway. I just it's unrealistic. And uh, when you're working with someone who does this as their job, they're going it, to it's it's a very pleasant and informative process of uh, my experience with it has always been positive. It's always been productive. Um, people who who do this kind of consultancy professionally, they kind of know how to how to pitch uh, their ideas to you in a way that's not alarming, uh, that you know th that is going to be that's going to spawn a productive conversation. 
It's just not an issue. The idea of you preserving your creative integrity is never uh, on the table in my experience. Yeah, and I, from my own experience, like when I have come into a place where it's just like, hi, so you said there's a problem with this, but I like this thing that comes out of it. Like specifically, this is a really powerful play point. So how do we keep this even if we trash everything else? Yep. And like, that's a really fun, not even a challenge. Like that is one of the fun things about working with a cultural consultant or working with a client is we see what you want and we make that a reality in a way that works. Like there's the only times like I've had to put down my foot is when a person is trying to do something like take a uh, multiple personality disorder and make that a thing which for anyone who's not familiar multiple personality disorder does not exist um it is really important that it's now known as dissociative identity disorder and there's a lot of commentary of is dissociative identity disorder even an official mental health disorder um because there are people who are multiples who don't have it um and I can go into like a whole panel about the nuance, about the difference between what it was and what it is. But I think you can hear they're completely different things. One exists, one does not exist. And it's really harmful when you make that mistake. So like, if you don't want to fix that mistake, that's just doing pure harm. And that's where I have to say, no, you can't do that. Um, but I, I will do everything within my ability to avoid saying no. Like I will do whatever I can to educate you so we can get to a happy yes on both sides. Because that's what I enjoy doing is being able to say yes. Have you ever been in the situation where you uh, had to end a project because there was a disagreement or a conflict? Usually the other person just, I don't wanna say ghosts me, but like I, I get paid and then we don't communicate any further. Um, mm -hmm. So I haven't ever come across any major conflicts um, but it's not, it's not the solution I want. Like I, I prefer being an educator. Um, and I yeah. really like working with people who put the effort in. So I try to remain optimistic and say, maybe the next time around we'll do better Something because else. most people I've worked with want to do well. Right. Well, yeah, obviously they're investing in it, right? They're, they're, uh, they're making a commitment, which is great. I, I think uh, some people feel anxious about uh, this kind of work because they're worried that a consultant is going to accuse them uh, or call them out as a racist or a sexist or uh, that they've made some horrible mistake that uh, is shameful. Uh, and uh, I, that's also not a, not a thing. Uh, you, you may well have created something that falls within those harmful definitions, but they're a professional and they're going to point that out to you in a, in a way that is sensitive and respectful and you can move on. Uh, y you can be wrong uh, and it's fine. Trust I've me. I've been wrong a lot of times. Like yeah, I am a specialist in my field. I am not an expert in the things that I'm not my field. And so I lick my wounds. I pick up the pieces. Yeah. I move forward and I remain friends with people who have just like, done a whole bunch of emotional labor that they did not need to do for me. Like, but they wanted me to do better mm -hmm. because they cared about me. And yep, yep. people might say, oh, I'm paying money. Of course they care about me. But it's like, no, not we don't do the money. work if we don't care about people learning. We want people to do better. We want yep. you to do better. And this, that same sentiment applies to play testers and friends and other people who might be like, hey, man, think, think a little harder about this. Uh, that's certainly been my experience. And the example I gave earlier was friends who who were, you know, they were doing emotional labor, right? To sort of, they weren't educating me about colonialism, but they were definitely taking a social risk that I would be hurt or offended or angry or whatever to say, hey, you know what? You need to do this a different way or bury this project forever. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that, you know. So we have about 10 minutes left and a whole bunch of questions. If okay, uh, I will put the asterisk as Jason has a panel immediately after this, mm -hmm. but for anything I can answer, I will be available in chat after. So Wonderful. if I don't get to your question, join me in the lobby, uh, hang out afterwards and I'll try to get to it. Cool. So first asking, 
I'm, I might combine some of these just to so we can get to multiple. Is there any time when you feel like you can, you can't do a topic where not just the yeah. difference between a topic can't be done, but are you the right person to do mm -hmm. a topic? Or is there a topic that you can't touch even though you have experience with it? And how do you kind of navigate that when it's not about the society, but about who is doing it? 100%. Um, uh, there's a lot of times when I'm like, that's a cool thing. I can make a game about that, but it's not my story to tell. And uh, in those cases, I do my best to find someone whose story it is to tell and give them the idea. So no, that's, that's, that's where I'm at. I think the other option is, as we were saying, bring a cultural consultant in early. True, like, yeah. Am, am I sure? Like, it's, it's hard to tell if you are the one to write the game sometimes. Like, I have a game that I'm working on that is about the uh, process of dealing with chronic mental illness and the process of getting better. And so it deals with other people's mental illnesses as well in order to give some sort of variety and not only have like one mental health disorder on everybody's plate. Um, and in that case, like I'm an expert on these things, but also it's not my lived experience. So I'm going to bring in a cultural consultant anyway to deal with each one of these topics, despite how it's literally my profession to know about these topics. So we then also have questions about when you go towards more very problematic topics, especially like what you like with Winterhorn. How do you balance allowing people to explore these kind of mentalities or mindsets or building themes into that with someone maybe just not even realizing that this is a thing that isn't so that they aren't supposed to do? Like if you have combat or something that allows people to have fantasy, how do you not make it just don't think about it? Or I, how do you, sorry, I'm, I'm mangling this. No, I, I, I see your I, question. I like I see the question. Mm -hmm. um, for me, how I deal with it personally is, this is a thing that I personally put in my design is I will a lot of the time intentionally write in biases uh, mm -hmm. in order to get people to do stuff. Um, so this works because I'm well-versed in what biases are and how to navigate bias. So I hate to sound like a broken record, but there are cultural consultants that deal with exactly this. So you can bring somebody in to help you figure out like what direction a person might take it in. Um, play test, play test, play test, because it will happen at the play test table if it could happen. Like play tests are the best for breaking a game. Um, so yeah, I it, it, there isn't one happy answer. Um, Something re related to that, um, you you're in, you're responsible for structuring the experience. You can onboard people uh, so that they, their expectations are set appropriately. You can create a a culture of play within the game that allows them to engage with the thing that you think is important. And then you can debrief them. And in the debrief, de you can, rolling. yeah, you, well, you can de-roll and, you know, you can specifically say, this is what this game was about. Think about it. Right. So that yeah. if, if they do what you say, they, they at least won't miss that point. You know, it won't be high fives. We destroyed the, 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 uh, peaceful protesters. <laughs> So then kind of on another side of that, is there situations where it's okay to, as it was phrased here, let people explore their dark urges, just games that where it is, where you can play out toxic desires or where you had mentioned, Jason, where you can just have combat or fight something. Are there situations in which that's okay? Does that always have to be some form of commentary or push against it? Can it be as a release, as a parody? So with a release or with a parity, it's still a commentary. Like if you were writing a game, you are making some statement about something. Nothing exists purely within itself. Um, that being said, does everything need to say a lot? No. Um, a lot of my most popular games are like really silly, fun games. Um, and they just happen to like make commentary on startups and the toxic culture related to that. Um, and people have fun playing around with that. Uh, but it's kind of what we got into earlier is whatever experience you're having at the table, if it is a release, if it is catharsis, 
you have to get consent for all of the players there and like make sure they know what they're walking into. I'd also say that all games are political and choosing to be apolitical is a political statement. Uh, so if uh, if your intention is just to be dumb and have stupid fun, then you're making you're making a choice. You're making an ethical choice. Uh, and that's fine. Just know you're making it and be clear about it. I've got to go. This has been great. And thank you, Anne, for inviting me onto this panel. Uh, last places to find us. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, you can find me at bullypulpitgames.com. And I'm at JM Star on all the social things. Got to go. Bye. 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 And so I think we're going to wrap there. Uh, my name is Anne Raffet. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at under slash MNGWA under slash. It's there in chat somewhere. Um, I'll see everybody on the Discord. Thank you so much.